lately, for the last maybe 10, 15 years, I have uh, started working with backwards with technology. So I am going towards the 70s and maybe 60s and 50s and 40s. This is for me um, kind of a um, reflection on technology which connects with a practice that is called media archaeology. So it's basically there is a whole philosophical approach, but the idea is that very often technology is presented as linear and uh, has something that improves every time. So your new iPhone is supposed to be much better than the previous iPhone, it's supposed to be much better than the previous one. So the higher number, the better the the thing, but this is an assumption that is not always true. I mean, first of all, you can uh, argue what is really better. Is it better for the environment? Is it better for us? So you have that aspect. And also, but not only, also the performativity is not always better, or certain things can be more fascinating. For example, I find very fascinating electronic of the 70s for uh, the analog sound of synthesizers or for the video. Um, you know, you have this liquidity that in uh, digital projections kind of is lost, it's very flat. You see, digital projection is black, it's not really black, the white is not really white, so it's kind of this like a little bit. There are certain things that you can do very well with these projections that you cannot do with analog, of course, and the other way around. So for me, it's always a, maybe throughout I will talk about this here and there. Uh, but I think it's very interesting to uh, debate assumption, especially now that we are kind of stuck with many problems, uh, pollution, recycling, uh, what to do with the old stuff. Uh, most of our trash that we produce is uh, screens. So my work that is exposed there is this, and I use an old cathode ray tube that otherwise would go to the shores of China somewhere, and you know, um, yeah, pollute. So yeah, there is a political action, but there is also an aesthetic action. So I try to diverge a little bit from the mainstream of digital things. Um, and this allows me to be a little bit more personal, maybe. Not really personal, but I have less competition, let's say. So I, uh, I'm a bit more, uh, I feel like it's a bit avant garde, but also it's nice when you are free from aesthetic comparisons. So, for example, because I'm a musician originally, and uh, yeah, if you make electroacoustic music, there is so much that has been done, you know, and is the or if you make techno, for example, is difficult to really stand out because there is shit tons of amazing musicians, shit tons of terrible musicians. I mean, there is everything. So in general, when there is too much people in one place, I always tend to go the other way. If it is a poor restaurant, I go to the, I explore somewhere else, and. So I do the same with art, and then I start doing some weird uh, manipulation of analog stuff, and I find myself in a field where there is less crowd, and so I have more space. It's as simple as that, and also less um, uh, aesthetical rules sometimes. You know, you create this kind of, you know, you arrive, you're young, and you find these big monsters that are there that define, that pave the road, and and it's fresher when you are when you discover America and you're the only one. I mean, you probably will exterminate the poor Indians in that case. But you see what I mean? That's true, natives. <laughs> but the, you know what I mean is that you find a open canvas and you define the new aesthetical rules and you can do basically whatever because there is no right and wrong. And I think this, for me, is the place where I find the most interesting. Uh, the place to do art, because then you are defining your own aesthetics instead of trying to follow other people's aesthetics. Like you have a formal floor at 135 BPMs. Okay, you know, you feel already like, ah, I have to fit in this dress and I don't want, and my body's, I want to be free, you know? So that. Uh, 
But maybe the best is, I'm also a very practical person, so I like to talk, but I also like to show things. So maybe I start with showing what I do. Here is a bunch of stuff, uh, but the, actually it's pretty simple. I have two speakers because most of my practice, I like to listen to the sound that compose the image. This is my own personal choice. It doesn't have to be like that, of course. Nothing has to be like I do. Well, first of all, actually, that's the best way to do something original is to do different. Uh, so I have usually the same signal that I use, which is voltages at the end. So it's electronic, it's not sound, it's not light, it's just the language basically that I send to the speaker and it becomes sound and X and Y, so it's two channels. And then the same I send to a monitor or a, or a laser or different things and then it becomes light movement. So I draw with the same signal that creates the sound so you can listen to the light or watch the sound without any arbitrary translation. You know, when you, when you go to a VJ situation but then in general, there is an arbitrary choice of translating something into something. You have maybe a red sphere on the kick drum or a white square on the snare and this thing go like this. And so there is an arbitrary choice by the artist to map something into something. Um, I like the fact that I don't have that choice. I just have a splitter cable. So my signal goes here and my signal goes there. This is a laser. And, uh, and so it becomes apparent, and I don't have to think about it. And I also like the fact that I have only two signals, like my hands. So I can modify one and the other. It's very intuitive. The, the problem I have sometimes with software, I'm a, I'm a, I've been coding all my life, so I'm kind of good at coding, but my problem sometimes is that you, in software you have so many parameters possible especially in the case of, uh, of image, because in principle you can assess every pixel and you have three colors per pixel, so you multiply this and you have like a million options. Uh, so you have to somehow define some rules how to make sense of this complexity. And for me, it's quite nice that I can boil down to two signals. So I can think in a kind of human way instead of thinking in a computer way with uh, too many parameters. Uh, so that I like and also it's very quick because I can use it with a computer but I can also just take the uh, voltages from a synthesizer. You can use a PCB rack but you can use also just a microphone with some amplification and you can just plug it in and you have it straight up. But I have a feeling your choice of equipment dictates your music taste as well. Because if I send a very complex sound to, to your yeah. XY output, it will be a total mess on yes. the screen, right? Yes. So, so you, yes, of course, you restrain your, uh, your possibilities. But for me, this is always a sign of creativity because you have less options mm -hmm. and you have to be creative with those options. This is also another reflection on technology. We have uh, sometimes, especially in the world of modular synthesizers, people tend to have huge, well, it depends on the money that they have, but in general they like to have a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they do the same instinctual thing that everybody does. So you put an oscillator into a filter, into a VCA. If you don't understand this terminology, it's not important, it's just functions. And it's always the same structure and so everybody does exactly the same thing. But for me, the most interesting is you have three modules and you recombine them in a weird way that maybe allows you to uh, obtain a different aesthetics. What I'm interested in is in different results. I'm not interested in everybody yeah. doing the same thing as you understood. Mm -hmm. I think this is the basic creativity. Otherwise, what are we doing? We are just the replicas of some dogmatic law from who, Ricciotti, or... Someone who first you know. came up with the idea that you can yeah. turn from the paper. 
Yeah, I agree with this, this idea that people somehow are distinguished by people that try to find their own aesthetics or people that group into trying to, and then you establish this kind of weird dogmas that, oh, music has to be this and this and this. No, if you play rock, you have to have a snare and kick and then and then some distorted guitar and somebody screaming with long hair. You know, like why? You know, maybe it can be somebody without long yeah. hair, standing in the back, the guitar can be clean, the drum is not there. Mm -hmm. I don't know, you know, like, let's try to do opposite. Um, yeah. So, in general, this is what I do. Uh, today, I'm going to show you how I use a laser because it's easier to project. And I think it's also interesting in general for you. It might be useful. You can use it for simple visualization, so you just plug it there and you see what happens, or you can create signals on purpose so you can somehow draw with it some shapes. It works very well with simple signals, so square waves, sin sinusoid, so it's a good also didactic tool to learn synthesis from scratch because you're listening and looking and you're like, oh, this is falling away, a sine wave does this, you know. Um, and for me, it's appealing because I am a musician, so I use sound as a signal, which is something that I've been thinking about, so I can go quick into that. If you are musicians or something like that, then it's easy. If you're not, then I will show you how there is a software to do that. I use Max, but you can use PD, Super Collider, you can use Ableton, you can use VCRA, you know. And you can use analog. Usually, lasers are sold to uh, laser technicians with some proprietary software and some little box that is an analog digital converter. It's something that talks between your computer and the laser. Most of these things, if you do you know a little bit of video, how a video works, there is a frame rate. So, when we're looking at this, this projector projects at 50, 60 hertz. That means that there are 50, 60, now there is the same image, but there is 50 times the same image per second that is printed. And we see it as a stable image. But, uh, yeah, this is the sample rate for video, because our eyes, but there is a physiological thing, our eyes see at 30 hertz, let's say, sample rate, so if we go double, then we see continuous. That's why if you reduce the sample rate, you start seeing flickering, like stroboscopic, sometimes it's disturbing, some people get epileptic and they fall on the floor. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there, is, there is different uh, things. But um, what I like to do instead is to bypass all of that and just plug my signals directly into the laser. This is the, this is the trick how I do this. And, um, I will share a folder with you where you have the information how to build this. It costs maybe 10 euros. There is no active components, maybe 20, let's say. There is no active components, so there is no plug, no electricity. It's called passive. And it's very funky because you can take five signals, audio signals, so jacks, mm -hmm. is the typical highway for sound signals. And you connect it here, and on the other side, it goes into laser the plug. This is a typical laser plug, it's called DITA, International Laser Association Device or something. Um, and so basically, I just made it so that my ground and the pin goes to the output of this guy. So I can, hello. Uh, so I can just basically stream my sound signals directly into the laser and I control it analogically. What is the difference? When you build your own hack or your own devices in general, this open ups, opens up uh, aesthetical possibilities. And this I always find fascinating because all of a sudden you're not in the same aesthetic field of these people that use proprietary stuff. First of all, I don't like really proprietary stuff. 
So I like DIY. Is this, you know, for me, is a whole philosophy that comes from the seventies, from the back movement, the squats. For me, that makes it everything horizontal and shareable, and you know. So, but there is a difference. So, for example, if you use software like Touch Designer or VVVV, uh, probably you have a protocol that is sent to the laser that goes to a box that is that requires drivers that are written in the software. So, for example, there I will show you the Ether Dream, or there are a few of these little boxes, and. So, Touch Designer needs that box to communicate to your laser. But then, because somebody coded this, it's, there is a philosophy of that guy in it, which is that you have 50, 60 Hz lasers too. So, laser has segments. You will see, I will show you. Laser is built with segments, and every segment has only one color. So you basically send a stream of points and a stream of information of colors and then you can build your own image. This thing is good if you are working for a logo. For example, uh, Mercedes or the BMW wants you to have their car and to put the dots so you can light up the dots of the car. You do a kind of laser mapping and then you have to move the dots in space. And but if you're trying to improvise with the system, it's impractical because you have to send points and colors. It's a bit complicated. And also, you can see that it's very blocky because you reason in terms of segment. If you send only voltages, then you can make... Uh, I mean, imagine that you're making a circle with segments. You have to make a lot of little segments. And if you want to make a gradient, you have to change the color of the little thing, so it's a little bit digital. And but if you send the voltages through, then you have all this fluid stuff because you don't have digital sampling anymore, and you don't have sample rate. You're just moving a point in space, so it's, it's completely different aesthetics in a way. And that's why sometimes I have people that come and say, like, "Oh, how can you have this fluid and the colors is so smooth?" Because I don't have sampling, I don't have computer digital stuff, and even if I do it with a computer, my sample rate of the sound card goes to 192 kilohertz, so I have basically 30,000 more points than the 60 hertz that has the normal uh, software idea, because the software, the digital software is conceived like video, so you could Think in frame per second. But audio has much more definition, so even digital audio has more um, precision than, than the segments that you do. So you do different things. And also it's nice because if you have voltages, then you can play with the synthesizer and you see directly the result. While if you have a software, you have to map it to MIDI and then maybe you need a parameter that you want that's not mapped, so you have to. I don't know. It's like it's better, in my opinion, to improvise. If you're improvising with a laser, it's easier with voltages somehow. And if you are doing more like professional, precise work, then yeah, it's better the software. So it's like everything. It's good to understand when a tool is better than another. You know, it's difficult to eat the soup with the screwdriver. And it's difficult to, uh, you know, uh, put a nail down with a, with a spoon. You know, so there are things that make your life easier than others. It's good to understand tools. For me, it's most fascinating also about many archaeologists to understand what a tool does and how I can use it in a better way for certain things than others. So. Very often it's also the matter of opening a tool and understand how it is made. So I make my own lasers and you know I take all the lasers and I open them and I build them myself and so I have control on I like to make the tools that I use in general. I started by building my own synthesizers and then now I build my own lasers and so I have the control on on as much as possible on 
uh, all aspects of my, my, my production chain, let's say. Okay, so it works like this, I show you. 